Welcome to Democracy Ish. I'm Torre. And I'm Danielle Moody. And extremely sad news to report to you, fans of Democracy Ish, who I love hearing from on the Twitter. I love it when you guys come on the Twitter and tell us how much you love Danielle and how right she was and how great she is. Um, this is my last uh, episode of Democracy Ish. Danielle is going to continue on with other people <laughs> somehow. Um, but uh, we still love each other, but I have new chapters opening and yes. other chapters must close for new doors to open. Um, and you'll hear about some of that. But um, for now, what I can say is this labor of love that I have enjoyed doing immensely is coming to an end for me. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, I knew who Danielle was before this idea came to mind a little bit. Um, but then, <laughs> but then we did a panel together on Joy Reid's show, um, when she was doing the Saturday morning, Saturday, Sunday morning show. And I was so impressed by Danielle and her energy and her spirit and her professionalism and her like deep knowledge of, 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 of what we were talking about and her sort of warrior spirit and the connection that i felt i was like oh wow like i feel like a lot of chemistry and like i felt it on the set and then and then sometimes afterward they do a little impromptu green room to like like here's like here's an intern's or a producer's iphone like chat up like what you talked about and you know for like 60 seconds and i felt this like real chemistry like it felt like we had been doing stuff together for years and i was like you know you're really good we should do something together and she was like i mean of course tori i would love to do something with i'm you. pretty oh, sure God. that's <laughs> and then she asked for my, my autograph <laughs> <laughs> and oh i said no God. autographs please don't look me in the eyes and um and it might have been a year or a year and a half after that or a so. year later yeah it was around a year later that the that the opportunity really came up um because I was like this this crazy uh presidential election is happening and there's no podcast that is like looking at the election from a black perspective um the way that I want to exist and Danielle was the first person that I called and um she was like hell yeah let's go and I think a week or two later we, we started, started do recording this and um it's been an honor to ride with you um danielle is always ready no matter like we <laughs> often decide what we're going to talk about seconds before we press record danielle needs no time to prepare she was always ready in terms of knowing all the facts and all the reality behind the situation uh, whatever political thing we're talking about She's always angry. You never always. have to rev her up about that. I cannot ever think of like, mm, that was a bad show. Mm, Danielle was a little off her game today. It like every show is like, damn girl, like you brought your shit today. Like every episode. And, um, you know, it's been a joy to rock with you for this. What are we doing this for like two years? It's been it's been a little over two years, yeah. um, and it's you know and I Torre, you only say nice things when we have an audience, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not true. When we turn when we turn off the mic and we finish the show, and I'm like, really good show, and I'll text you like, you really brought the fire this week. It's you true. You really killed it. Like, see, in private, I only have nice things. In public, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but it's just to rev you up. Um, I will say that I had always been a fan of your work. And when we had the opportunity to do TV together, I was very excited uh, because I always thought that you were really smart and funny. And, you know, when the opportunity presented itself to do Democracy-ish, I thought, hell yeah, I want to talk shit 
you know, once a week <laughs> with the tour, Ray. Um, and it was, it's been a really great time. And I want folks to realize that initially we had only said we would do this show for a year. It was supposed to be, if you go back and you look at the descriptions, it say, says it was a countdown to the election, but because you all were so engaged with us and we were having such a good time and the world seriously seemed like it was going to continue to fall, fall apart. We wanted to continue having the conversation, um, each and every week. And I think that each and every week it got better. Um, Tore, you have pushed me to pay attention to culture in a way that I'm just like, oh, I don't care. Are the world you, is are you like paying attention to I culture. I do. I watch things now that aren't the news. I read things that aren't about the news. Okay. Um, in order to have like a wider perspective on what's going on uh in the black community. But I just, you know, I, I gotta say, I, I really think, you know. I'm really happy that we have this archive of our, the growth of our relationship, because the funniest thing that people say is that they're like, they like how we fight and banter like brother and sister. I say that Torrey is the brother I never wanted (laughs) and the much older brother that I never wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it has been, it has been a really extraordinary, I think, you are living in really crazy times. And so to have the norm of at least knowing that once a week we were going to be able to unpack it and to feel like a little less crazy together, but also give some insight to the folks that have been listening to us for, you know, for all of this time, um, which I think has been really like a beautiful experience. And I am sad as folks, you know, may know, I don't often say I am sad that Torre will be leaving us, but tell the people what you're going to do so that they will uh, well, continue to <laughs> follow you. Or if you can't announce it yet. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to dig into that just yet. And I do want to give this moment, um, the honor it deserves because it has been a joy doing this with you um and it's been very cathartic the whole thing of like you know if we still have a country (laughs) emerged organically you just said that in the moment and like we just kept saying it and thinking about it because it did for a while for a while it was like we cannot really be certain that we're going to have a democracy in six days from now. And like, I don't know, we are, we feel like the train that is American democracy is teetering on the edge of the mountain and the least little wind could blow it down the hill. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it, it, we would sort of be screaming, not at each other, but at America and what's going on in America. And yeah. like, pulling our hair out about like, oh, this country is going in the wrong direction. And it's, it, it was somewhat cathartic and somewhat bluesy and somewhat maddening. Um, but it was always, there's nobody who I would rather watch the country fall apart with <laughs> than you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what was, I mean, the, the crazy thing was, you know, we we literally have seen so much like, you know, we just we we were in quarantine, hadn't seen each. I mean, when we started the show, we were, you know, we were in, you know, in a different studio, but we were in studio every single week. And, yep. you know, trying to you know, we're joking, but we're figuring out what the hell Trump is doing to the country, what Democrats aren't doing. And then it was like we were in a groove and then boom you know, the pandemic hit and we were like, so what are, what are we doing now? Um, and the nimbleness that we had to be able to continue not, and literally the, the world at that point is now falling apart. Everything stopped, but we kept going and just talking about, I, and then hadn't seen each other to We hadn't seen each other in person in a long, in a long time, <laughs> in a long time. So it was like, so it's been such a bizarre time. Like just to think that the show has been on for a little over two years. And in that time, we've seen a catastrophic election and a catastrophic global pandemic all in that little time. That's exactly why we kept saying at the end of each show, I guess we'll be back because we had no fucking idea. 
Yeah, it's been an extraordinary time to do a show where you're looking at the world of politics. And I mean, you know, when I was at MSNBC, we were covering the second Obama administration and it seemed apocalyptic at moments. We had ISIS, we had school shootings, Mm -hmm. we had the rise of the... We had the explosion of the the events that led to Black Lives Matter. I mean, Black Lives Matter itself, but all those Trayvon, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, like all those, and it seemed apocalyptic. The two years that we've been doing this show seems far more <laughs> insane and apocalyptic than uh, than the two years that you know. But it's. You, uh, you've been amazing, an amazing partner. I think a lot of folks don't realize we don't do any editing of this show. No, we turn <laughs> I don't know. On the they mic probably don't. <laughs> and we roar and we just go and we finish and we never like cut things out. And like, you know, it takes quite, it, it's, it's live to tape and it takes an extraordinary partner to be able to pull off live to tape. And, um, you, you know, like, like I said, you've been a great partner in terms of the, the rapport, the, the back and forth, the yin and yang, the, the, you know, the sort of like, you know, the, 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 the back and forth, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that you can achieve with just anybody. Um, and it's been, it's been exciting to be in that groove with you. Yeah, I would say that, you know, I've done other podcasts in the past um, with different people. And yeah, I don't think that chemistry is something that you can't create. Right. Like, I, I I truly believe that when you see people that you like, you know, on television or you see or you listen to folks and you're just like you're listening to them for a reason. It is because of a natural chemistry that they have and the rapport and the way to kind of flow through conversation. I mean, I we we pretty much do have done this show like we're sitting down at, you know, at dinner <laughs> And yeah. just like, yeah. and what's the theme for today? And kind of going back and forth. And that's what's felt so natural. Even my my sister, who is Tori's, of what he just said is his favorite member of my family because she and loves him. And Hi, that's Nicole. Only, and that's only because <laughs> I haven't met your mom and your dad yet. Right. I'm sure if I met them, you would fall to fourth. You, you know what? <laughs> um, but my sister has Actually, been fifth. like, shut up, has said, you know, like, yeah, Tori kind of does seem like your brother. And this is my older sister saying it like, oh, it kind of is. It kind of is that like, oh, I could imagine him, you know, being in our family, which I always thought was super, which I always thought was super cute um, and 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 lovely. But I OK, so I want to say this. So what are some moments or topics that you think that we've covered that have been like, oh, that was a really good conversation or like I wouldn't have wanted to have that conversation with somebody else. You know, Is there anything I, that I, comes to mind? I mean, you know, the it's interesting because in, in, in some ways we come from different corners of the world. You know, you are so black, but also your queerness is an important lens for you on the world. Um, you know, and that's something that I, that's a corner of the world that I had to learn about. I mean, like, and I can remember very, um, very distinctly, like learning when I was in high school, like, oh, certain teachers that I like are gay. They were, when I was in college, when I was in high school, there was an anonymous letter written by a teacher to the school paper, basically saying, there are gay people here. We are your friends. You know, oh, we are okay. in your family in this school and you should respect us because it was not uncommon to throw around the F word just mm-hmm. messing around with each other and not realizing somebody might walk by who's who's gay 
And, you know, and at that point, LGBT was not used right. at all. Right. It was um, just gay. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that may offend or traumatize or trigger that person. Um, and learning that and going to college and having uh, gay and lesbian friends and learning what that meant and, and really sort of trying to grow into um, just fully accepting these people. And, 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 you know, because this was not something that, that was discussed a lot as I was growing up. So, you know, you coming from a different part of the world and yet we have it. So, so many of the shows we agreed on the issues, the mm-hmm. ones that really leap out to me a little bit more are where we disagreed. Um, you know, the Chappelle conversation about the closer, we had a lot more disagreement than we normally have. Um, I, I remember the Simone Biles conversation, oh, but yes. even more, I remember, cause I was, I was, I was in Boston at my mom's house for some reason. I remember driving home like, you know, 10 minutes before the um, conversation and you text me, what are we talking about? And I wrote back, Simone Biles, and you said, and you said, if you come for Simone Biles, I will cut you. <laughs> I and I wrote cut back, you. knives out, bitch. <laughs> it was right. You sent me a gif, of course, of like somebody with daggers out. Because your whole commentary on that was that mental health doesn't matter. <laughs> essentially, that, is not, that was that is not my point. That is essentially what that I was, took from it. That was that. That is a that is a gross and disgusting reduction <laughs> of the point that I was making. But what I remember was having this really uh, interesting and I think valuable uh, joust with you and this interplay mm-hmm. with you. A lot of times, you know, in these sort of shows, people just agree with each other, and I tried to find areas where you might disagree. And like, there's really not a lot. Our politics overlap a lot, but where we could find those areas where we disagree, it was very, um, it was very powerful to sort of like fight and go back. And I, but I, like, I felt like we fought without it being fight e, without it being disrespectful, without it being annoying, without it being obnoxious, without me feeling like, ah, like you know, I'm bloodied. It was, you know, it was. It was a trading of ideas. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the, the only hard part of the show was like going on Twitter and all the fucking fans are like, Danielle's so great. <laughs> Danielle's so smart. Danielle's so right. I was throwing tomatoes at Torre on the, on the Because iPhone. you love being a contrarian. Like I'm not you, a contrarian. I'm right, but all of you guys are like. Uh, I'm like. How is I'm it that the all of us was, could be wrong? It was so, well. I mean, QED. <laughs> but I mean, it was very Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Because I'm like, you guys. I'm doing the show too. And they're like, Danielle. Ah! <laughs> I will say that one of my favorites um, were the shows that we did over the summer of 2020, the uprisings show, because you were out in the street, you were out doing bike protests and walking protests. And I was not, um, because my mother, as folks know, had just had brain surgery and I was with her, no vaccine, no nothing. So I was very much limiting my exposure, um, to anyone, uh, as a, as a way to keep her safe, but being able, I think to have both of our perspectives of you being literally out and on the ground, uh, during that time in your pictures and just the conversations and the energy, um, that you were sharing with us, I really appreciated and thought was so, and thought was really important because it was just like, we were seeing, like we, every, we, we had so many different vantage points and like, here I was, you know, on Long Island, like away from the direct action of the protests, but like you were in it and you were, you took, you took your kids, didn't you? Or did you not? I did take my kids, um, to a few of them. They were, I I think they, it just, you know, just with their age, they were, they were, they had a limited appetite for them. So they went to a couple of things. Um, there were a couple of marches that were 
designed to uh, in, embrace children, um, you know, but I mean, like, I, I was, I mean, for a while, I was, I, that was the only thing that I would leave the house for, but I was leaving the house all the time. I, you know, I, where I lived in Brooklyn, you could quite often hear people marching down our block or a nearby block. And if I heard the noise, I'd grab my shoes and run out there with them. I remember one protest was marching down DeKalb Avenue in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And I could hear them from my apartment. And I grabbed my shoes and I ran out to join them. And they were marching down the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm like standing in the street like, this is civil disobedience. Come in the street. <laughs> They're marching on the sidewalk. We don't like, march the on problem? the sidewalk. <laughs> we march in the street. We are trying to slow down capitalism. We are trying to inconvenience people. That is the point. If you're marching on the sidewalk, you're not doing anything. You have to march in the street so that the entire world must sort of slow down and see what you are doing. We are trying to stop people from doing their normal things. What we are talking about is so important that you must stop. I know you're going to work. You're going to pick up your children. You're going blah, blah, blah. You must slow down and think about what it is that we're doing. That is incredibly important. Um, so <laughs> that, that, there was and, that. And, you know, and, and when I'm... When I yelled at the folks to come in the street, they did. They did come in, to their credit. They did come in the street. I think they were just like, "Yeah, we march on the sidewalk. This is nice. It's not supposed to be polite. <laughs> we're not supposed to fucking march on the fucking sidewalk." My other favorite uh, favorite time, not because you know, oh, it's like enjoyable to talk about the Karens, but um, the Central Park, the bird, the uh, the the bird watching. Um, and Amy Cooper Amy and Chris, Cooper. yeah, Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper, um, the man that she was calling the cops on. I thought that that conversation was really what, because again, you know, I'm a black, you know, a, a, a black queer woman, but like as a black man, I was just like, God damn, like you can't even do the most mundane of activity. Bird watching would be the most mundane, like non-aggressive, non-threatening thing to do. And here's this, here was this woman and here was that conversation. And I was just like taken aback because I realized I'm just like, you can't really go anywhere. And I think that your experience, particularly, you know, as a black man, but as, you know, a father as well, I've always taken into great consideration and esteem because it's a, it's a perspective I don't have. And while I can feel unsafe for a variety of different reasons, being in that conversation with you was also really eye-opening. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been eye-opening to me at times to see the world through your lens. And you are unapologetic at injecting, you know, as a queer person, uh, the, the world looks like this. As a queer person, the world functions like this. And you know, I think sometimes when we come from the less dominant or, le or or the oppressed community, we can ad adopt a a worldview that is centric to them. I think one of the key no one of the key notions of maturity in Black people is not having a white centric uh, perspective, mm -hmm. and, and and some you know, but centering yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can be, you know, like Du Bois, have double consciousness and understand what white cis centrism looks like, you know, and that may save your life or help you survive or help you thrive. But to see the world from a black centric way and for a queer person to see the world from a queer centric yeah. way is really important. And, you know, one of the things that emerged for me from the Black Lives Matter protests of 20. Uh, 20 was was to become even more unapologetic about saying what I really wanted to say. I feel like I encountered people and reached a sense of feeling of like, no, say whatever you want to say. Don't worry about if it makes white people uncomfortable. And I think I was already there, 
but at, through 2020, it pushed me even further to yeah. like, I really don't care if this makes you uncomfortable. This is what I feel. And that's what, and I'm not going to sit on my hands and not say that thing. And you have always been comfortable to, to see things from a queer centric way to inject your uh, queer perspective and you know forcing me and others to take your perspective into account and to take it seriously and to make it an important way of of seeing the world and for straight people for cis people that's not always natural um yeah. you know and but it's important and and you've been you know pushing us to do that not just on this show but also on wack af you've been doing that for <laughs> Did I, did I say something wrong? Did I say oh, something wrong? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> did I, did I, Whatever. Did I, oh, did I say something wrong? No, you know what? I, 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 I joke because I think the Josh and Brittany episode <gasps> so was one of my good. favorites. And, and Whack AF, you said Whack I AF. did. I did say and it. And it just came out just, just naturally. And I was like, wow, that was amazing. You just pooped on yourself. It's such a funny way, but I love Josh and Brittany. I wanted to bring them back, and the opportunity the opportunity never came because the the real world was so juicy. It was not like, well, let's do a bizarro world. Like it's like, no, we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this. like you know every week. It was something that we were burning to talk about. Um, but I, I love Josh and Brittany. That was so great. That was so, I don't even know why we decided to do that, but it was, it was like there was it was like how long. Was, how long can we keep it going? And it was an entire it was, episode. It, 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 was, it was, there was nothing that was burning in the news that week. And it was like, let's, let's do a bizarro episode. And like, yeah, how long can we keep the joke going? And it's like, do you like, you know, you were, you know, you're, just, you're good. So good as a broadcaster that you're able to like stay in character <laughs> For 30 minutes. Now, I love that episode. Because it was just like all week. I mean, we've had, we've had Republicans. Uh, well, a Republican. I think we had one Republican on the show, on this show once, um, back in the day when we were actually bringing on guests. But it's because we know their narrative so well. We know yeah, all of the things that they are going to say, which is just like, just think how you would think and do and say the opposite. <laughs> but it's like, can you do that for 30 plus minutes? And we could. It was just like, wow. We should have sold that podcast to Fox News or Newsmax. We'd be multimillionaires. <laughs> well, I always thought about that. Like if, if things got really hard and I could go to Fox and be like, you know, I've had a change of heart. You guys were right all along. All along. I'm 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 on your team. I'm he- right because the black people who are willing and able to spout that bullshit. Oh, forget about it. You like you can make a lot of money. You know, it, like the amount of money you can make at MSNBC and CNN as a black lefty is peanuts compared to oh my if you God. are willing and able to sell your soul and go yeah. over to Fox and be a black conservative. If I could do it, I can't do it even for. But I think that they believe, don't you think they believe it though? Like we're joking and we're saying, okay, could you do it for the money? Right? Like, but I I don't think they're pretending. I think Candace Owens and, and all of them, I think that they believe the hot shit that comes out of their mouth. I, I, I don't, I don't know that Candace Owens believes what she's saying. Are you sure? I don't know. I think she's a pro- Jason Whitlock. I think he believes what he's saying because he's uninformed. Um, I'm trying to think who else is is black and and righty and and performative. Is Dan Boncino black? Is he he's mixed? Unclear. Uncle- <laughs> unclear. Uh, unclear. 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 I, I, you can't spell unclear without uncle. Add a couple letters and you have Tom. But oh, here we shit. are. Oh shit. Wow. I, you want to go think, out on a rocket ship then? I think okay. he's half I think he's half black. I've never really in, I've never really um I don't you know, I don't know if he if if I don't I don't believe Candace Owen believes. Like like I think she does. I mean, essentially 
Condoleezza Rice just offered Candace Owens's full line of talking points last week on The View. So I'm like, and Condoleezza Rice believes all of the things that she is saying. So I, there's nothing that tells me otherwise that these people are just in it for the money, which is sad. Well, I'm see. This is funny because I'm looking this up, and it says Bongino is half Italian, and they asked him if he was black, and he said he was Italian. Fine, but I don't see. But that that Does means he you're, only look Italian. No. Well, if you're, hey, look, if you're Italian, you're part black. Come on. But oh, we're using the one drop rule. <laughs> Hannibal in the house. Um. <laughs> I don't be- I don't know like if you could put Wonder Woman's lasso around Candace Owens would mm-hmm. she be like yeah this all the stuff that I say is what I really believe I don't know I don't I know I mean you I know- think that cuz we always want to look for the good in people and there are some people that have absolutely no good in them she's one of them well, interesting. And, you know, one of the things, this is, this is a classic argument on the left. Do the folks who are right-wing media stars believe in what they're actually saying? Are they performance artists or do they really believe this? And I remember one person I knew from the right who would refer to certain people like Glenn Beck, for one of them, as a true believer. He's a true believer. Mm-hmm. But I took that to mean you know that there are others who are not. You know Rush Limbaugh doesn't really believe all the crap that he says. I'm not saying that Sean Hannity, for one, goes home and secretly he's like, "Uh, if only we could get to single payer, this country would be on the right track. (laughs) Or that Tucker Carlson is going home and he's just like, you know, thank God for the vaccine. It saved so many lives. Yeah, I don't don't think, you know, I don't. I don't think Laura Ingram gets home and she's like, oh, you know, really, if we if only we had more immigrants in this country, it would be richer and more diverse. And, and I, I don't love think so. I love when at black athletes speak up. I think it's important. It's important. It's so valuable. Um, but I think there are some people who are true believers and there are some people who are performance artists and who are ramping up the anger and the outrage and the sense of the world is raining down on us, but do they really believe? I mean, like, are they truly unaware that immigration is like, you know, are they truly aware? Do they really think that Obama wasn't born here? Do they really think that Trump, the election was stolen? Do they really think that one six was Antifa? Like, no, they don't, but they see, uh, they see it as a game. They see politics as sport. They see that if they can ramp up an audience to up here, that they will get yeah. paid a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then they can I, sell all the horse dewormer and panic food that they sell on these QAnon sites. Look, the right used to be... I'm talking about like 20, 30 years ago, grounded in serious ideas. We disagreed with them, but they were grounded in serious ideas. Um, They had a worldview and a perspective that made sense. And the modern right is basically like, we want to own the libs. Everything that the left says is wrong. You know, everything up is down. They don't believe anything that media science, um, or elites say that is not a perspective. They don't have like, like, so if you had all three branches of government, what would you enact? Well, we would roll back this and this and this like, no, 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 no. What would you, you, what would you create? Yeah. What would you create? Well, I don't know. I don't know. And we've seen that in the last 20 years. Like they all, you have all three branches of government. You're in power. What do you want to create? Like, you know, Trump, McConnell and the, and the house. What do you want to create? We have Nothing. no idea. We don't they, know. We don't know. You know, as soon as Democrats got a little bit of power, we pushed through major healthcare reform. Mm-hmm. We're trying to change that system. We've tried to change the way that we do immigration. We're trying to do something about the climate. We're trying to do something about police reform. The right doesn't have big ideas. They're just like, climate change is a lie. You know, immigrants are ruining the country. Trans people are ruining the country. Critical race theory is ruining the country. You know, the, uh, w- wait, but this is not, 
these are not ideas that you don't have any ideas that you believe in and you're fighting for. And I, you know, I, I, I do feel like they are mostly performance artists. You know, I, I think that that is true. It's really funny, also sad, because one of the big things that happened during Parkland, right, the Parkland shooting, was that the right was referring to these young kids as crisis actors, as if that's actually a fucking genre of acting, by the way. It's not. Um, but referring to them as crisis actors. Meanwhile, everything that they do is a performance. And, you know, what? what is the thing that they push? They push whiteness. Because when you, in 2020, we talked about it, what was the RNC platform? They didn't have one. They didn't feel the need to create one. They said, rock with what we did in 2016, right? Like as if the world hadn't changed at all. And I think that the, the bad thing here is that we talk about this, we know this, but Democrats don't offer that. Like to say, by the way, the last time that they had all branches of power, what did, how did your life get better? What did they offer? Did they change public education? Did they offer their idea of Obamacare after 66 votes to try and repeal it, as well as many Supreme Court? Uh, No, we've never even seen a draft of anything that they were going to offer in response. But that's the thing is that it it's so easy to be them because all you have to do is say no. You don't have to create anything. You have to say no and work as a blockade. And that's it. It seems like they are rooted in. We still have to get you back for Roe v. Wade. We still have to get well, you back for the back. voting for the voting rights uh, uh, bill of LBJ. We still have to get you back for the Civil War. So you're fighting bad. Oh, and we still have to get you back for the for FDR's New Deal. So we're we like you know we're fighting fights from you know forty to a hundred and twenty years ago, rather than dealing with okay, what are we going to do now about our future? How do I mean like the entirety of the movement seems like let's roll things back let's slow down progress let's everything is fine don't change a thing which is actually a very interesting political strategy one of the interesting articles that i that i remember reading about the 2020 election why did why was trump not punished more obviously he lost but he was not punished for his covid stance and, you know, not many people voted based on that. And because for a lot of people, the message that there's really nothing wrong here was yep. soothing to them, despite all evidence to the contrary, being told this is this is not a big problem, relax them and ease their anxiety rather than the other side. Our side was telling them we have a major problem. We have to fix it. That is anxiety inducing. So they would rather be lied to and mm-hmm. told everything is fine rather than having to deal with, we actually have a problem here. That's, That's so deep. And that is and that is frightening. And that is exactly where we are, that it's easier to be lied to, stay inside of your protective bubble regardless. And, you know, don't let anything penetrate that because then you'll have to grab grapple with reality. And who wants to do that? It's much easier to yell, rage, and blame a whole bunch of people that don't look like you, don't love like you for everything that's wrong with you, except for you. Yeah, we have a major problem in that we have one party who does not believe in the truth or reality, is using the legislative system uh, in, 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 a, in an oppressive, aggressive, warlike way. I mean, God forbid one of the Supreme Court justices should die. We will not have a replacement for them before we have another Republican president. Oh, right? no. The, yeah. The, we'll, we'll, know, we'll rock with eight. We'll rock we'll with seven. Or we'll seven. rock with five before yeah, I mean, before I mean, that were to ever happen. Yeah. Yeah. However, until we get another Republican president, which is quite frightening. Um, but they, they, they don't believe in reality. They will... They will get warlike over any lie that binds them together. The 2024 election will be very much about a Republican nominee who is anti-mandate and anti-vaccine entirely and Mm -hmm. anti-the notion that we have to do something about COVID. And I have no doubt that COVID will be a part of the 2024 election. And the Republican, to get nominated, you would have to be anti-vaccine. 
Yeah. And it's entirely frightening to imagine what will happen and where we'll be by that point. Um, and then, you know, on the other side, we have a party that's really not strong enough in combating the insanity and the warlike posture of the right. So we have a system that is not really working because we give too much power to the minority party and the minority party is is insane and going off the deep end and the 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 larger party is not strong enough to deal with the minority party's insanity so no, here we are and and here we are and the only place that i'm telling folks on woke af and telling folks here there's only one way that this ends i thought that it was going to i thought that we were going to see legislation i thought that we were going to see a redirect i thought we were going to see a strengthening of our guardrails a strengthening of um our, our our branches of government in recognizing all of the flaws that trump and trumpism illuminated for us i thought that trump was could have been a good measure for the country if in fact we used him as the barometer of what will never happen again. And then we created laws and policies that were a reflection of just how bad things could have gotten, but we didn't. So the only other course of action that we have with a defunct Department of Justice, a toothless administration, and a, a deteriorating Congress is revolution. That's where this is headed. And it's the only thing that makes sense. So people should be aware. Thank you. One last time Yay. for listening to Democracy Ish. It has been a joy and a pleasure to do this with you. I feel, I do feel brotherly toward you. So our friendship will continue past this day, um, even without this show to bond us. Um, I love you and I appreciate I love you. doing these doing this show with you for these years. And um, I know you will continue to have great success going forward because you are an extraordinary broadcaster and a very important voice. Thank you, Torre. You will be missed. I will miss our banter um, on air, but it will continue off air. Um, love you. Appreciate Thank you. you. Thank and you. will we have a country left? God only knows. God only knows. God only knows. God only knows. 